Hey YouTube, it's Dimitri, and today we're gonna to discuss an interesting email I got. It focuses around compensation um, in the data science world. Um, I'm not sponsored by this company by any means. It's called Birchworks Executive Recruiting. They send me emails occasionally um, trying to get me to switch jobs, which is fine. Um, but I just thought the data was quite interesting and something that a lot of our viewers on this channel would actually appreciate. And so I was just gonna dive in and talk a little bit about their data, their surveys, and kind of how this impacts um, the quant world and kind of how I think about it and some of the things I think that should come out of this. So first off in the email, uh, they say this is like a survey for quants. Um, I'm just gonna clarify here. First off, I don't think this is quants at all. This is data science. Um, the link says quants. You click the link, it takes you to this page and it says, you know, survey, results, what motivates analytics professionals and data scientists to change jobs. Uh, these are not quants. I don't think Birchworks has a clue what a quant is, which is okay. Um, but the data still applies to a lot of us in data science. Um, I looked at a lot of the results. From what I have seen in the industry, it does apply similarly to quantitative finance, which is why we're gonna go dive in and talk about this. Um, they ran a survey and they asked people to do uh, the top two factors that most motivate them to change jobs. The list of factors they looked at was one, uh, salary and compensation. Number two was career growth and advancement opportunities. Number three was challenging work and ability to learn new things. Number four was switching industries. Number five is a work-life balance, flexibility in working from home or remote. Um, and then number six is benefits like 401k insurance, perks like, uh, I don't know, free food, on-site gym. That's what they've listed here. Uh, but if you dive in here on this chart, uh, they took this survey, and I think these don't add up to 100% because they have two options, so you pick things twice. Uh, I wish they would actually have converted this more into a 100% realm. Anyways, so the number one um, reason people switch jobs is salary and compensation. This is no surprise uh, in quantitative finance, data science. The reason being is that a lot of people are driven by money, which makes complete sense. Uh, I think a lot of people tie this to like a value or net worth. Like, you know, if I'm getting paid more, it means I'm doing more meaningful work. It means the company appreciates me more. So therefore I'm looking to make more money and go to a company that has more appreciation. Uh, the second one though is growth and career advancement. And I can't drive this home enough. I think a lot of people, I think different industries specifically, and I think banking um, is kind of missing out on this piece. And I think a lot of people on the banking side, and especially in the MBAs where banking used to be like the number one career that all these MBAs would go into five, 10 years ago, uh, it switched. All these MBAs now are going into consulting and into IT, kind of like the tech world. I think the reason for this is that you have growth and career advancement. Uh, I think the tech world is a little more innovative. Uh, they're wanting people that are very skilled. They're wanting people that are exciting, that are different. And I think they have a lot more variety and options what you do in your job as well as the career growth opportunities. So you can see different paths for getting there. Um, banking is very, very structured. Finance in general is very structured. Um, just as it goes in general finance, right? You have two years analyst, two years associate. Uh, if you get an MBA, then it's you know, two years analyst, MBA, two years associate, um, and then you go on to like AVP, VP, SVP, uh, assistant director, director, managing partner, uh, managing director, stuff like that. But it has kind of like a linear process. But when you look more at the tech world, it seems like there's more kind of like fluidness. It seems like a lot of times there's not this rigid structure. There's not so many layers. Um, and I applaud the risk management area in general because a lot of these banks have actually gotten rid of a lot of the structure. And so you typically have very flat structure where a lot of people all report to one person. And so everybody though might have different titles. They might have different compensation, um, but you're all kind of on the same level and have the same manager, which I think is a better option than having this kind of rigid chain. And then this leads into the third one here, which is challenging work and learning opportunities, which is 41%. So I've seen a lot of people jumping around from bank to bank, and a lot of this just has to do with the compensation uh, as a whole. I don't think banking is changing anything exciting. I don't think there's a lot of challenging work or learning experiences, unless you're jumping from say like doing, I don't know, auto loans and consumer finance to doing like PPNR or operational risk or something a little different. And I do see people jumping for that, but I also see a trend in a lot of people in banking kind of exploring other options, wanting to get out of finance. A lot of them feel somewhat trapped in finance. But I think the reason they want to go to tech is that the comp can be similar to finance and banking. So that salary compensation piece can stay static. 
but I think there's a lot more innovation and challenging work opportunities in the tech world. Uh, I think part of this is just kind of built into banking, right? We have all this regulation, uh, there's guidelines, there's things you can do, things you can't do. Whereas you dive into the tech world, yes, there's data concerns or whatnot, but it's very lax, very relaxed compared to the banking sector. We have all these regulations, you know, we still have to follow the same consumer protection acts as the tech industry. So we kind of have all these regulations layered up which I think prevents a lot of it, but I also think that banking is kind of stuck in the sense that a lot of the people in banking have been there for 10, 20, 30 years, and they're just not looking to really innovate and do something new and exciting and risk something and try something new. Whereas I think the tech industry, the challenging work, the learning opportunities, like data science as a whole is taking off in the tech world, finance is lagging behind. Um, yeah, there's some going on here and there. I've seen some banks where there's people on the bottom in the banking. So your analysts, they're diving in, they're excited, they wanna do machine learning but I just don't see senior management really understanding what's going on with the machine learning realm. I don't see them adapting it as, you know, someone would in a tech world where essentially you have an entire department doing that. And again, I can't say this is all banks because for example, Capital One loves data science. They've been doing it for a long time. Uh, that's kind of the reputation. And so I think in a general sense, a lot of people might actually give up the compensation that you might get at one bank to get more challenging and better opportunities. Which leads us to this last point here, which is work-life balance, flexibility, working remote. Um, this has been a big piece of risk management. Uh, when I started, I think it was a lot more of a draw of like trying to pull people into risk management from the stats realm, from data science, from machine learning, from financial engineering, from all these different areas. But I think as the banking industry and risk departments are becoming more mature, I think a lot of them are actually cutting back. They're not allowing you to work from home as much. Uh, they're not allowing as much remote access. So like being able to do this working from home or working from a home office like full time. Uh, I think the tech world again, like Google pulled back. They're not allowing that from what I understand a lot either. But there are some companies still in the tech realm. I think banks are kind of pulling back, but I think tech's kind of pulling back. So it might be a benefit, it might not be a benefit, but I think in general, uh, working from home is a huge benefit for a lot of people. Uh, it allows you to actually balance your work better because if you're working and you have six hours of work, you're right, you still have two hours that are kind of wasted. So if you're in an office, you're gonna be chatting with people and that's fine. But at the end of the day, it's two hours wasted, which you could have spent at home doing something better. Um, if you have a full eight hours of work or nine hours of work or whatever, and you still have a commute on top of that, say it's 40 minutes each way or an hour each way, you're saving like an hour and a half to two hours of your day. You could spend at the gym, you could spend it with your family, you could spend making dinner. I mean, you could do all this other stuff with your time. And so I think working from home is also a big key. And then these last two points in your benefits, change of industry. I don't think these were very important in general. Uh, I think the reason is, is working from home, work-life balance is probably the number one benefit. Uh, I think the reason for this is that 401ks, insurance and all that typically are fairly comparative across banks, across tech industries, across different areas. Um, I don't think there's a big driver there. I mean, getting free snacks and on-site gyms is cool, but I don't think a lot of people really care, especially in the banking industry. Uh, in tech, again, it might just be comparable. So you go from company A to company B, they both offer a gem, they both offer snacks, they both have the same thing. So there's no reason to switch from one company to another. And then change in industry, I think this is a big one, but I think a lot of people aren't out there doing it because it's so hard. Like it's so hard to explain to someone in tech, like I work in finance, I do risk management, you know, I do all these types of models, I work in this data, I solve complex problems using statistical theory and inference. And then tech world looks at it and they're like, oh no, we're like solving this other cool problem, but we're using these other tools like Hive and Spark. And they're all excited about that. And that's an R, for example, and that's exciting. But on the banking side, it's mainly in SaaS and SQL. It's more the traditional tools. And so I think there's a barrier actually getting from finance to tech, uh, as well as going from tech to finance. Even though a lot of it is very transferable from one side to the other, I think changing industry is hard. So I think it's not a main driver of why people uh, are actually leaving their jobs for other jobs. And then Birchworks broke down their data a bit more here. I'm gonna go through it quickly. I think it's fairly interesting. It's how motivations can vary by experience. Um, so no surprise, I think the vast majority of these are all based on compensation. It follows kind of that ordering that we looked at in the last chart. Um, things to notice though is like when you're 21 to 25 years of experience, the number one is work-life balance. Um, I think the reason for this is you start maturing, you have kids, you have families, and you start realizing that 
I've already made so much money, I'm not going to make a lot more with a lot of excess work. So going from like a senior position to like an executive position, um, your workload probably is gonna double. And at the end of the day, is it really worth like an extra $50,000? depends but then at that point too you're getting older you have a family so it makes more sense to value the work-life balance and one interesting thing from this chart which I thought was just kind of surprising was that when you have 26 plus years experience um, that 52 percent was actually saying they'd want to do more learning and I think this is somewhat counterintuitive because I think a lot of people have the connotation when you get older that you don't actually want to keep learning you just want to hurry and finish your work or you're like I don't know I guess there's a connotation old people don't want to learn but I think it's kind of surprising that 52 percent want to increase learning here uh, I think this is a big driver something that should be focused on uh, I think companies in general don't spend enough time uh, training employees or allowing self-learning during your work processes and again, I'm gonna drive it home. Uh, most jobs are not busy 40 hours per week or 50 hours per week. Whatever your allotted time is, you're typically there. Uh, you typically have downtimes. You typically have seasonalities. You might be slammed during this season, but dead during this season. Or you had two big projects come in and you finished them and now you have like, you know, a slow period. I think companies should be spending more time actually investing in their employees, uh, allowing them to self-learn or helping kind of push people to do online learning or have a company-wide kind of learning program that employees can take advantage of. Motivations can vary by region. I didn't see a lot of differences in the numbers, to be quite honest with you. Um, they break out some of their theories here on like West Coast versus East Coast versus, you know, Southeast and whatnot. Um, yeah, there might be some differences here in general, but I don't think overall there's really any difference between these. Uh, at least nothing you could take advantage of as a company uh, trying to attract better talent or as an employee who's looking for a better job. And finally, here the last chart in this newsletter that they sent out was how motivation can vary by gender. Um, I thought this was fairly interesting and I think it's somewhat predictive. The biggest one for men was compensation. It's far more than women if you look at this last chart. Career growth is also larger. Uh, the learning I think was about even, so I'm not gonna say that's any difference there. Industry and benefits was negligible in general and the gaps aren't too large. But the two to really look at is one, the salary. Men seem to be driven a lot more by salary. And then the second part here is that women seem to be a lot more driven by work-life balance. Um, again, it's something I guess I would just predict, something I would think about. Um, I wouldn't want to actually say it, but the data here kind of shows the same thing, that women prefer to have better work-life balance as one of the top benefits they prefer, uh, whereas men seem to really focus here on the salary portion and kind of the growth and like the career-driven aspect of it. And so I think companies in general can do a better job at catering both to men and women by offering more flexible benefits while also maintaining uh, a solid culture and structure uh, and keeping on track and getting a lot of work done, but also benefiting the employees and catering to how their needs um, kind of match here based on these surveys. Anyways, that's a breakdown of this newsletter. I thought it was fairly interesting to look at data scientists, comparing them similarly to quants, um, that salary is definitely the biggest one we'd expect that but that learning and self-growth and like work-life balance are also things that play a crucial role in people changing jobs. I think companies should learn more from this data and I think employees should actually think more deeply about this. I don't think companies spend a lot of time actually talking to their employees and thinking like, hey, you know, if we let somebody work from home a little bit more, it'd make the job easier and make it more relaxing or less stressful. Um, Maybe we could help them with self-learning. I found this is a huge thing in general that I fight with a lot of employers about is if you have downtime and you do self-learning, a lot of people get upset. I don't know why you're improving yourself, especially when the topics are related to your job. And then these employers actually end up using those skills that you learned uh, months ago or years ago uh, to help improve their positions and do better work. So anyways, that's just kind of my take on this newsletter. What do you guys think? Let me know in the comments below. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. And as always, until next time.